So, atmosphere, mostly nitrogen, and then this stuff that we really need, oxygen. The remainder is carbon dioxide, ozone. What is ozone? All right, what we breathe is two oxygen molecules bound, atoms bound together. That's O2. Ozone is O3. Okay. Ozone is um, important because there's a thin layer of ozone up in the stratosphere that helps block UV radiation because it absorbs UV radiation. And we didn't have the ozone layer. It was a big issue when I was your age. We didn't have the ozone layer then um, we would get more UV, we'd get more cancer, we'd get more bad things happening to us, we'd have more vision issues. Before I was your age, we were producing chemicals that were floating up and destroying the ozone layer. And we discovered this because a hole developed in the ozone layer over South, um, over Antarctica and it started getting bigger. And then we decided, you know, we figured out what was going on we start, stopped using fluorocarbons and the ozone layer hole started closing back up. So ozone is produced naturally by the sun's radiation, by those charged particles coming in and causing oxygen to form ozone. But we were depleting that protection that we had from the UV radiation. Enormous issue when I was a kid. Right? We're, this is our first big thing that we saw hey, we're causing this, and in this case, we actually were able to reverse the effect. Um, because of the unique composition of our atmosphere, we breathe, right? You know, if we went to Titan, <coughs> which is a moon around Saturn, we'd have to be able to breathe methane if we wanted to live. So our atmosphere is unique to us. Why do we call, all right, this is about the greenhouse effect. Why do we call it the greenhouse effect? Has anybody ever built a greenhouse? All right. In a greenhouse, you set up layers, glass layers and stuff like that, and it gets warmer inside because of the sun coming in. Well, we call what's going on now with our world climate the greenhouse effect because we're adding in <clears throat> materials to the atmosphere that help hold in the heat we gather during the day instead of letting it escape back out at night. Right? And because we're holding in more heat, it's getting warmer and warmer and warmer. There are... If we look back in the, um, if we look back over the last 800,000 years, and we look at carbon dioxide trapped in different materials, we can look at over time those levels went up and down and up and down and up and down, but now we've started really going up, right? Because this is us in the last, the last um, what, a couple thousand years, right in there. Right? This is us adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So, <clears throat> oxygen shields us from UV, right? Most of that ozone, O3, is way out there. Um, well past the point that we, which we can breathe it. O3, if you ever smell it, I mean, well, okay, it'd be hard for you to know you were smelling it. It has a, we create it sometimes with, around electrical equipment. It has a distinct odor. So if you know what it smells like, you can sometimes tell I've got some electrical equipment that's arcing a little bit because when it arcs is when you get the ozone created. Um, it's slightly poisonous. Um, a guy called me up one day said, hey, I've got an idea, we can, you know, we can make ozone, we've got a depleted ozone layer, we can make ozone, and people just set it free, and, you know, they can pay for a bottle and let it go, and it's like, yeah, no. <laughs> it's actually bad for us, you know. It's good up at 25 kilometers. It's bad here in the road. So, 
he was disappointed that I was telling him no. No, it's bad. Um, so, let's see. Okay. This is just what I've been saying about the ozone layer. Where did our atmosphere come from? This is a great question because it's relevant to current events because Pluto has more atmosphere than we expected. Right? And so, where did our atmosphere come from? And a lot of it, we believe, came from volcanic activity, came from comets hitting us, all kinds of things like that. Right? So that we didn't start, we started out more of just a rocky ball and then we developed an atmosphere. Once we're big enough, so when you're a small rocky ball, you have no atmosphere. The, the moon has no atmosphere, right? The moon has no atmosphere at all. The moon's just vacuum. When we send a spaceship there, you know, back when we used to do that, we spend something there and it lands on the moon, it kicks up dust, and so you have an extremely thin layer of material that lasts for a little while, but then it either all goes out into space or collapses back down and you're back to there's nothing. Right? So the moon is not big enough to hold air molecules. They'll just go off into space. This is why we know we started off as a rocky ball and it's only once we reach a certain size that we can even begin to collect an atmosphere. And the things that built up our atmosphere were volcanoes and collisions with other things, comets coming in. Comets tend to be big, icy things, right? And so they add water, and they add water vapor. Um, so all this material from the outside coming in, as well as material from the inside coming out, we believe is how we ended up with an atmosphere eventually, because we know we started off too small and built up material, we had none to begin with. Atmosphere is different today than it used to be. Um, there are a number of things contributing to that. Um, one of those, they don't really point out here, but one of those is we reached a point, um, I think about three billion years ago, where life, small, little, bitty, single cell life, switched over from um, producing carbon dioxide to producing oxygen. And so what life was doing on the planet changed and that began changing the atmosphere because microbial life was changing the atmosphere. This is actually, if you read sci-fi, is one of those things we talk about in sci-fi is can we terraform a planet by sending the right microbes to it to change whatever they have there into an atmosphere we could believe, we could breathe. So we talk about the motion of the Earth. We're going to talk a little about what that means. We don't. Here we are. This is a picture. This is exaggerated a lot, right? The Milky Way orbits like this. So in the Milky Way, we're going around like that. But here we are going around the Sun like this. So our path around the Sun and the path of our Sun around the Milky Way are not lined up. Right? There's no reason for them to be lined up. It's not like the planets which formed out of the same disk that formed the sun. Right? It's not the same thing, not the same process. So the earth is going around an orbital motion around the sun. The earth is spinning. There's a consequence to that spinning. Um, a lot of the spinning of the earth is what creates our ocean currents and what creates our air currents. Things like the jet stream, things like the Gulf Stream. Right? These currents are because the Earth is spinning. Something's called the Coriolis effect. So to understand the Coriolis effect, you have to imagine if I throw this, it goes in a straight line. Right? 
if I'm on a merry-go-round, if I'm on a merry-go-round and I throw it, what does it do? It actually still goes in a straight line. But to me, I'm on the merry-go-round, moving, it looks like it curves. Right? The Coriolis effect, and the reason hurricanes end up actually going in curves and turning like that, and clouds end up doing that, is the air is trying to go straight and the earth is turning underneath them. Right? So the wind is trying to go straight, the earth is turning underneath, and so the result, well, actually they're this way, the result is the wind ends up curving relative to the surface of the earth. Just because the earth's moving underneath it. Right? So it ends up curving relative to the surface of the earth, and eventually you do end up with an actual motion, rotational motion as all of this air comes in and ends up rotating around. The, um, one of the huge advantages the Brits had uh, a couple hundred years ago over every single navy out there was they had figured out the Coriolis effect as one of their top secrets of the admiral, admiral, admiralty. Um, and so they had charts for all their, all their can, cannons that said, if I'm facing this way and I'm shooting that far, I have to correct the Coriolis effect by this much. And so their guns were more accurate than anybody else's guns because they corrected for this. <coughs> Not an enormous effect, but an effect of several feet over a couple of miles. And so it makes a big difference on whether or not you're actually hitting what, you're, what you want to hit with your cannon. Um, Coriolis effect, you can see on other planets due from the bands that form around them. Jupiter and, now Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, these are gassy bodies. They're, they don't have solid, rocky bodies like the Earth, right? And so, because they're gassy, and we watch them, these inner bands of Jupiter actually go around faster than the outer bands out here. Right? And so a lot of the turbulence you see at the edges is because there's a band moving past another band. It doesn't, it's not, it's not the whole thing moving together. Different bands north near the middle are moving faster than the ones towards the poles. Other thing that happens, remember when I had the bicycle wheel here and I held it up and it sort of spun around slowly, right? The Earth is spinning and points right now at Polaris. Now, if for some reason someone saves my lecture on that for 14,000 years and somebody watches it, they're like, Polaris is not in the north. Polaris is over there. Polaris, where are we? Polaris is over there. They'll say, Polaris isn't in the north. Polaris is right <coughs> over there, right? It's because the Earth slowly. <coughs> Over, over 20,000 years, the Earth slowly changes where the North Pole points. <coughs> like a top that spins, you know, when you spin a top, and as it's, it hits this point where it's doing this, it goes from being like this, <coughs> starting to do like that, and process around. Like the wheel did when I had it hanging it up, it processed around. So the Earth is slowly processing. And so what we call the North Star is a North Star now. Right? And it will be the North Star for a little while. You know, within our lifetimes, it's still going to be the North Star. But we're slowly moving away from it and processing around. So, if we wait around for 26,000 years, we'll be back to Polaris as the North Star. Okay? We'll come back around to that. This is a, um, if we were to look at a map of the sky, right, this 
is the circle that would be where the north is in the sky. And right now it's here at Polaris. happening Sunday. It's a lunar eclipse Sunday. Right? So I'm going to look and see exactly when it's happening here. And um, I'll probably end up posting assignment for you guys to go out and take a picture of it and post that in Canada. What happens if we get up at 4 in the morning? Uh, then you go and do whatever athletic event it is you need to do. Yeah, well, that's again, I'm going to look and see when it's happening first. If it's happening in a reasonable time, I'll say, here, do this. If it's not happening in a reasonable time, then I'm going to say, hey, if you get a chance, go out and look. You know, I'm, you know we don't get to control astronomical events. Makes sense. All right, any other questions? All right, I will see you guys on Monday, Tuesday, 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 see you on Tuesday.